<clears throat> All right, well, hello everyone. Hopefully you are enjoying your day. I know it's kind of a virtual situation right now, but hopefully you are still enjoying your day otherwise. Today, this is Mr. Richmond speaking, by the way, so I will be presenting this lesson to you today. We are talking about influences of weather now in this next lesson. So today is November 18th, 2020, but we're just going to go through different things that have the influence on weather have influences on weather throughout the next few days and we will be discussing things such as air masses fronts hopefully you read about those in the textbook yesterday and hopefully you read the article about fronts also we'll be diving into that and we'll also be talking about some other things later on that contribute to the influence of weather so that's our topic for the day and for the next couple of days so let's dive right into influences of weather First of all, I wanted to point out the book, the textbook mentioned something about the water cycles influence on weather. So I wanted to kind of do a brief review of this um, because you guys have had this in a previous unit and you guys have still still seem to have a pretty firm grasp of it. But I do, I do want to go over it just in case. So we all know that the water cycle begins with evaporation. And when evaporation happens, that means that water is leaving the ocean because of the heat from the sun and heat in general. Heat heat rises and also the water vapor that comes off the ocean rises and as it reaches cooler air in the higher atmosphere it begins to condense. So as it begins to condense it begins to form clouds um, and then once the clouds get heavy enough with water it begins to precipitate and fall and then it's collected on land and it runs back down into the water. So this the water cycle definitely has the most important influence on weather because without the water cycle there wouldn't really be thunderstorms or any form of weather or any rain that is life-sustaining, so the water cycle definitely has, has is the most important influence on weather, and that's probably why the textbook further emphasized it in in reading. So, and also consider the idea of transpiration, where water is evaporating off of leaves. They also included that in this little graphic here. So, this is a little overview of the water cycle that you guys talked about previously, but I just wanted to go over it again. So what influences weather? We're going to dive into this. I wanted to start with this video which, that I think is pretty, pretty cool. It is a video of 10 years of weather radar. I'm going to go full screen on this so you can see it. But you can see all the country, the United States of America, and you can see all of the different, all the things that are popping up on radar here are all the different storms that have happened over the past 10 years. So right now you can see the timestamp at the top. It's the 29th of March, 2015. And this is just flying through all the different types of storms that we saw throughout. This is five years ago. This is from five years ago. So you, red and the red and yellow boxes that you can see pop up on the screen at times indicate severe thunderstorm watches and tornado watches. Red for tornado watches, yellow for severe thunderstorm watches. So that's why those boxes are there. But one thing I really want to point out about these storms that are popping up is they seem to have, storm setups seem to have a structure. For example, right here. There's like a band. You can see like a band of showers and thunderstorms develop, bands of showers and thunderstorms developing. They don't just like develop in random spots most often. They usually have some formation. So there's a line, there's a band of storms right there. They follow from like right there. I'll pause it for a minute so you can see like a particular band if one happens to pop up. Um, you, you can see that there's still more storms down, to, there's more storms often down to the south than there are to the north, more severe ones, because it's still spring. All right, uh, that's not a good spot. Here, let's let's keep going. I want to get a good spot where you can see a nice solid front form right there. That's perfect. So right here, you can see that little band? That can be an indication of where two air masses have met, two differing air masses. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the concept of the air mass. And where this band meets, it's most often where precipitation occurs between two air masses that are of different temperatures, different moisture content, and different air density. So more like more than likely what's behind this little band of rain here is colder air, and what's ahead of it is warmer air. So that's what leads to the formation of these different bands of showers and thunderstorms is two differing air masses, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's get back to what well, back to the PowerPoint presentation. All right. 
So after this lesson, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to explain how an air mass leads to the formation of a front. And you can also describe the different types of fronts that exist in the atmosphere. You guys read about this in the article that I gave you yesterday a little bit. So we're going to elaborate on that a little bit so you can learn more about it. And also, hopefully, you'll be able to relate the concepts of air mass and front to the weather. So let's dive right in to this lesson on air masses and fronts. So, start. Air mass is a large volume of air in which temperature and moisture content are nearly the same throughout. So, if you look at this little graphic down here, um, you can see where there's like a cold air mass and a warm air mass that are meeting. Um, you can see the little fronts there, as you read in the article. We'll go into those a little bit later. But right here would be, we could consider an air mass. It's when it forms when air over a large region, region stays in place. And once that air forms over a large region and it just sits there for a while, a place where there's probably not much wind, air takes, air takes a similar temperature in this entire air mass. So say it's the cold air mass. Air takes a similar air temperature in the, in the surface below, beneath it. So the air mass will form. And as it enters a new region, these regions will take on the weather conditions of the air mass. So you can see this cold front here. As the cold front advances, and this air mass starts to overtake certain spots in the, in, of the surface here. The surface here, as the cold front moves, will take on this air mass's characteristics of temperature and moisture content. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about these an air mass moving and giving a different temperature to this area of land. So now we're going to look at it on an actual weather map. So I've shown you guys these oh, quite a bit. This is a very elaborate, these weather maps are usually pretty elaborate. But here, let me try and, there we go. Now I can get into it. All right, so this is a, this is a graphic of Tuesday at about 7 a.m. Tuesday at about 7 a.m. And what this graphic is showing is that this little high pressure spot here, see the big H? You guys looked at this in the gizmo you did the other day. So you have this H here. This could be, this is most likely a air mass right here. See the little black lines on this map? Let me zoom in a little more. Let me zoom in just a little bit more. These little black lines are called isobars. And usually high pressure air masses have, have these little isobars that circle around the entire high pressure system, which this is, this is the high pressure here. So these isobars represent the rising pressure in the air mass. So this is the whole air mass. And as the air mass has changed, you can also see the changes in pressure. So you see where these little black lines are getting really close to each other, these isobars. That's where you get this, this air mass, which looks like it's probably a maybe a warmer air mass moving through because you can see all the red lines going through. But yeah, this will be considered two separate air masses that are meeting together. These air masses aren't differing enough to the point where there's much moisture produced in, in the plain states such as Nebraska and Kansas. But there are two separate air masses here that are um, definitely moving through the United States. So I wanted to show you that graphic. This we would consider to be most likely an air mass as appearing on a weather map. All right, so back to this. All right, so air masses that meet can typically lead to the formation of a front. And a front is caused by air density differences between two meeting air masses. So say you have a warm air mass that is in front of, well, the front. So if you have two air masses that one is warm, one is cold, they tend to come together, um, that can create the front because the two density of the air, of warm air, is, is it's less dense than cooler air. So the less dense air, when it meets the cool, with the, the dense air, because it's cooler behind it, that leads to the formation of the front. So it has a lot to do, so what causes the density difference? It has a lot to do with the thermal expansion that we've been talking about quite continuously in class. So as air gets warmer, it expands, and as air as air gets cooler, it contracts or it gets denser. 
So the largest differences in air density, and the largest changes in weather. So you can see this image here of a shelf cloud. This is likely resulting of a cold front. So in front of this shelf cloud, you see in front of this shelf cloud is more likely the warm air, and warm air gets pulled up in the thunderstorms. In that video we did a few days ago in class that discussed thunderstorms, warm air usually gets sucked up into the thunderstorm in front of the shelf cloud that you see right here. And that is called an updraft. And then behind it, where the rain is produced, is the downdraft, produced by the cool air behind the thunderstorm. So this is front here. And it's very apparent because of the shelf cloud that was produced by it. Fronts are the most prominent reason for the development of showers and thunderstorms. And oftentimes, like in this picture here, they can be the producers of severe thunderstorms. So um, when, when we look at fronts, we definitely keep a close eye on the warm air and the wind around it in order to determine how strong these fronts, how strong of storms these fronts can produce. So let's look at fronts on a weather map again, another weather map. Here, let me see if I can fix this up. Got to get out of this, and there we go. Now I can move it around. So this is actually today's for or Tuesday's forecast. When I recorded this, I recorded this on Tuesday. But let's move to tomorrow's forecast. All right, that's tomorrow's forecast. So there's a couple of fronts you can identify on this map. And if, if you read the article, you'll be able, you will likely be able to see them. This right here, this red line, right up here above Michigan, MI, Michigan, is the warm front. So this is a warm front that's likely pulling warm air from the south into the north. And then over here on the west side, you can see this blue line stretching all the way across the, along the western side of the United States. It's a cold front. It's definitely a cold front, and it's pulling, pushing southeastward towards this side of the United States. And then here's the high pressure system I was showing you guys earlier that was sitting right over us. Yeah, this is the this is the air mass that is bringing us cool weather, but this is the air mass that's bringing us the cool weather. So these cold fronts progress south. These fronts progress different directions based on where their semicircles or their triangles are pointing and they move across the United States. So this is, these are pictures of fronts on an actual weather map. And you can also see based on the key down here, feel free to pause the video if you want to take a look at this map. But you can see this key here, behind the cold front, there's plenty of heavy snow, freezing rain, all kinds of different precipitation being produced, whereas the warm front isn't producing as much. And we're gonna talk about why that is um, in the next couple of slides, so stay tuned for that. All right, so, we're going to go back to our presentation here. All right, so now we're diving into the types of fronts. So there's four different types of fronts that we think of when we discuss different, well, when we discuss different types of fronts. So the first front I want to talk to you about, and the strongest front typically, is the cold front. And on the cold front, the cold, dense air in the front, oh wait, Cold, dense air in the back, I mean, behind this right here where I'm circling with my laser pointer. The cold, dense air pushes a warm, moist air mass upward. And so the warm, moist air mass is right here on ahead of the cold front. This is the cold front symbol here. And the warm air will rise. Since it's less dense, it will rise over the cold air. So there's warm air up here, and then there's cold air down here. So this cold air will push forward the warm air and push it over over it. And this is what causes the warm air to rise over the cold air and form clouds as it starts to condense because it cannot hold as much moisture at higher altitudes. So as it rises, it'll create these very thick, heavy clouds as it pushes off to the east. The cold fronts are the most common fronts to produce severe thunderstorms, and they are also the most common fronts to produce very strong winds like we saw last weekend. So you're most likely dealing with a cold front. All right, something just happened to my mouse. There we go. All right, so you're most, you're most likely to see strong winds with a cold front. All right, so that is a cold front. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit. This is a 
picture of clouds you'll typically see with a cold front. You'll see this with other fronts too, but you most often will see them with a cold front. So you could most likely identify this, this cloud with a cold front. Cold fronts are the leading cause of thunderheads or cumulonimbus clouds. So when a cumulonimbus cloud forms, you typically have, you follow my laser pointer, you typically have the warm air on this side rising over the cold front behind, which is back here, the cold front's back here, and you will cause the warm air to rise into the cloud, which is called the updraft, remember from that video that we did, and then the downdraft from the cold air behind it, going through a storm like that. So this is what causes the formation of these huge thunderheads that we typically see. So that is what forms cumulonimbus clouds. All right, so now we're moving into the warm front. And in a warm front, warm air moves over cold air, and the clouds will form along the top of the cold air. So over here on this side, we have receding cold air ahead of the warm front, or we just have cold air that's moving off to the east, and then we have the boundary, or the front, right here, as you can tell, right here. Here's the icon you'll typically see with a, with a warm front, and you can also see it down here at the bottom of the screen. I put it there for you. And this uh, warm front symbol will always point in the direction that it's moving. It will always point in the direction that it's moving. And usually that'll be off to the northeast or in some direction like that. And there's advancing warm air behind the warm front that will, that will rise above the cold air. Because remember, warm air rises, but as it rises, it can't go beneath cold air. So as it rises and reaches higher altitudes, it cannot hold as much water because the, the warmer air s slowly starts to become cooler as it rises. So this will form clouds along the top of the cold air, and that's why you get clouds that are like super high in the atmosphere, but then slowly start to get lower and begin to produce rain as you reach the edge of a as edge of a warm front, and that's how you can. Kind of tell a warm front based on how high the clouds are and if they start to get lower as they roll in. So that's a that's a warm how a warm front forms clouds and how it pushes cold air and warm air. And sometimes they'll produce some rain, sometimes they won't produce some rain. So it depends on the strength of the differing air masses or the different air densities as we talked about between two, two different air masses. So that all has a they all have a relationship. All right, so this front is one that is not really mentioned much in either your textbook or the article that I gave you. So I wanted to bring it up just a little bit. A stationary front. What a stationary front is, it's the point where two different immobile air masses meet. So those two different air masses that form are not moving or hardly moving. When that happens, you get this symbol down here. This symbol represents that are two different air masses and it points out which air mass is warmer and which air mass is cooler. Um, the warm side is this, this thing here. It'll point to the warm side, and this cold front symbol will point to the cold side. But they're both, they're both just sitting there. This is kind of where you can tell on radar where the jet stream is. And we'll talk about the jet stream in the next lesson. But this, this line here symbolizes two separate air masses that are of two different terror temperatures, but will can't push push each other out of the way or push or move any further at that moment. So you just have this symbol recognizing where those two air masses have met. Wind is what allows air masses to move. And when there's little to no wind, the air masses will not move. And that's where you get these stationary fronts or the boundaries between the two air masses in the atmosphere. <clears throat> stationary fronts can cause days of unchanging weather. They can come in many different types of weather. So some sometimes different Stationary fronts will just bring, oh, maybe some, maybe they'll just have sunny skies that day. But also sometimes stationary fronts can be stronger if the different air densities of the air masses are, diff are very, I guess, different. <laughs> so um, you, if you have two differing air masses where one is much cooler and one is much warmer than the other, that could most likely produce days of rain in certain locations. And... Days of rain can most likely cause flooding. So stationary fronts can either not have a 
big impact or they can have a really big impact. It's all dependent on the air masses on either side of the front. All right, and then this one is an occluded front. This one's kind of a very interesting front. So an occluded front is the point in which a cold front catches up to the warm front. So before this, before this cold front got, got to this spot, got to this point where this trowel is, um, you can see that this was originally a warm front because the warm air would have stretched all the way down to here. It's not stretching all the way down to here now. So now it has to move. So now, as the cold front catches up to the warm front, the cold front pushes back the warm air because remember, cold warm air rises above cool air. So the cool air will take a spot in the warm front and it can't get past the very cold air. So once that happens, you see the cool air rise above the cold air, the warm air rise above the cool and the cold air. And what you get here is you get this little right here where there's a little dip of warm air and that's where you get these very thick clouds that can bring lots and lots of rain. So occluded fronts produce a ton of rain typically and also they, they produce pretty fierce weather conditions including strong winds. So <clears throat> occluded fronts very often can produce strong winds. They're usually closer to the center of a low pressure system which we will be talking about low pressure systems come the next lesson and I'll, I'll show that to you. But, yeah, where you get this little situation here where the cold front catches up to the warm front and pushes the warm front upwards, that's where you get some heavy rain and some strong winds. So this is what an occluded front looks like on the on the radar when and it also points in the direction the system is moving. So that is an occluded front. All right, so we've talked about how to explain we, we learned how to explain how an air mass leads to the formation of a front. So when you have two different air masses of different air densities and different temperatures, it can lead to the formation of two fronts. It can lead to the formation of a front, and depending on where those air masses are, it can lead to the formation of different types of fronts that we talked about. So if there's warm air ahead of a cold air mass that's moving in, that's where we get a cold front. If there's cold air ahead of a warm a warm air mass that's moving in, we get a warm front. And then stationary fronts, the two air masses are different air densities and air temperatures, but they're not the same. But they're not the same, so and they're not moving. So that's where you get a stationary front. And then occluded fronts are a mixture of three different three different air masses in actuality, where a cold front catches up to a warm front and pushes it above already cold air. So those are the four different types of fronts. And if you were very confused about that, you can always look back in the video and re look at these explanations that I'm giving you. And also, you can relate with, with this lesson, you can relate air mass and front to the weather that we see. So I explained to you how occluded front usually leads to very thick rain, very heavy rain and very strong winds. And a cold front usually can produce severe thunderstorms if the conditions are right. Warm fronts can do some rain, but usually some very high clouds in the atmosphere. So uh, we explain that. And also, there is an exit slip incoming on Google Classroom, but it is not Google Form exit slip. It is this assignment that I'm going to give you right now. So this assignment is called is the Types of Fronts Concept Map. And what I want you to do with it is I want you to watch the video provided in Google Classroom about fronts. So there's another video in Google Classroom about fronts. And based on what you watch from that video and what you learned in class today, so also refer back to this video while you're making this concept map. You design a concept map. I'll explain to you what a concept, concept map is in a minute. Design a concept map with fronts as the main idea with four subsections for each of the following fronts. Cold front, warm front, occluded front, and stationary front. So here's an example. A concept map basically is something that where you start with a central idea your central idea being fronts, you write that on a piece of paper, you make a bubble and write fronts in that, in that piece of paper. And then you draw arrows out to the different ideas that are included in the main idea of a front. So for this, I would have you draw fronts and then draw an arrow to stationary front, cold front, warm front, and a front, and make bubbles for those. Then what I want you to do 
is I want you to take this idea of a cold front and write at least three descriptive phrases for each of the for each different type of front using what you learned in class. So say, all right, cold front. What does that mean? What does that mean? So that means you will get say large clouds or or occluded front can lead to strong winds. Warm front can lead to warmer air behind it. Cold front has colder air behind it. Stationary front, air masses aren't moving. So just like make three bubbles for each. This is the first starting model I want you to use. This is what I want you to use for the start of your concept map. And then on each of these ends of the concept map, write three different ideas based on what you've learned in class and what you learned from the video in the next three bubbles. Do that for cold front. Also do the same thing for warm front, occluded front, and stationary front. Hopefully that made sense. So add three descriptive words about each type of front to your concept map, and then submit it using a link in Google Classroom. So there will be a spot to submit this on Google Classroom, I believe. And once you submit it, I will take a look at them. So hopefully you learned something from this lesson on fronts. And if you have any questions, please let either Mr. Williams or I know, and we will do our best to give you a solid answer. And hopefully this was a helpful lesson. So get that concept map done and make sure to submit it and you will be all set for tomorrow's lesson. And I'm looking forward to it.